Ciao, Bella. I am Oceana Fortuna, and this is the Breathe, Love, and Magic podcast. We'll talk about a magical mix of mystical methods, including everything that works to live your best life, grow spiritually, and maybe find love. Open your heart, expand your mind, and connect with spirit to embrace the magic that is all around you. If you enjoy the show, please give it a thumbs up or write a glowing review and subscribe so you'll know when the next episode is available. And may good fortune come to all those who listen to the Breathe Love and Magic podcast. And now on with the show. Terry Hernan is an EFT practitioner who specializes in helping her clients gain clarity, find their voices, and achieve their goals. She discovered the power and efficacy of EFT when it relieved her of a stubborn case of insomnia following the death of her mother. She has helped people beat food cravings, improved athletic performance, and patterns of unhealthy relationships, eliminate limiting beliefs, attract clients, ease physical pain, and more. To get your free copy of the Easy Peasy Guide to Tapping, visit www.terryhernan.com. That's T like in Terry, E-R-R-Y-H-E-R-N-O-N dot com. And now let's meet Terry. So Terry, tell me about um, your kind of magic, how you found it, how you started. Let's hear about you. Okay. Um, well, I'll define my magic, um, if you can call it that. I would say it's my spirituality, which is something that I had from a very, very young age. And it informs everything. So, you know, as a child, one of the first things I knew was that I was going to die someday. I mean, that my parents taught me that very early. And my grandmother always uh, talked about that. And she was always talking about people who came before her, you know, ancestors, her siblings, um, you know, this other world, this other side, um, the saints, the angels. So these were like a big part of my vocabulary from the time I could probably talk, you know? So that's been with me forever. Um, You know, I grew up in a Catholic family, so we believe in a seen world and an unseen world, and that informs everything. So um, I would say that, and then the spirituality feeds into an imagination, which sees possibilities that might not exist for people who don't have a spiritual background or don't believe in things they can't see. For example, I believe in things I can't see. That is my magic. Okay. Oh, that's your magic? Yes. Um, well, that's very cool. Yeah. It's fun. Wow. So you both, Well, I definitely, I guess I feel the same way. I believe in things I can't see. And then there's some things I have seen that I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a story for another day. So, <laughs> so, um, so how does that magic relate to the work that you do? In terms of EFT, which is emotional freedoms, te- uh, freedom techniques, yeah. um, people will say, like, if you go to Wikipedia, um, I haven't been there in a while, but there was a whole screed about how EFT is charlatanism and that kind of thing. And um, really? yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, that was there. It's been there for years. And I haven't been to Wikipedia in a long time because I don't. Um, I kind of lost respect for it after I read that, because how can you dismiss something you haven't tried or you haven't um you only have to try it to know that it works right but there is science behind it and anybody who has questions about the science of eft and maybe i should define eft in a minute but um anybody who has any questions about the efficacy or the science behind it could turn to a book by dr peter stapleton who is an actual scientist who has um conducted all sorts of studies into all sorts of different um applications of EFT. Wow. So I had to tell you, I'm very, I was very curious. So I had the nerve to go look up EFT tapping at Wikipedia. <laughs> what do you see? Um, EFT tapping does not exist as a page, but emotional freedom techniques do. Mm-hmm. It says counseling intervention that draws on various theories of alternative medicine. So apparently that's been updated. So that should make you happy. It does make me happy because um, 
you know, when I first started taking it very seriously or studying it, you know, it bothered me that people were being dissuaded from using something that could really help them and change their lives. And when I was studying or in the lessons, um, the levels one and two, most of the people in my class were either psychologists or clinical social workers. We had a psychiatrist. So there were people who were taking it very seriously then. Um, and then I just thought Wikipedia was doing the public a disservice. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Well, I think that says a lot for what's happening today and how people are starting to embrace alternative methods and perhaps embrace things they can't see, right? Like, right. So um, that's really interesting. Okay. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to um, just dive, um, go backwards for a minute. And I want to talk to you because all of a sudden this is really in my head going, wait a minute, your grandmother and your parents were telling you about death as a baby. So what was that? Um, what was that like for you? Like, were you freaked out? Or what was that like? Were you okay with it? Or I wasn't freaked out at all. I remember just being very curious about it. Um, we always said our prayers before we went to bed. So we always had this relationship with God. It wasn't like we had this, um, oh, well, you just go to mass on Sundays and that's it. You know, it was, my mother was very specific that we should have a relationship with God. So that is like having a friend who's with you all the time. And of course you had a guardian angel, right? Um, you had patron, a patron saint. She, my mother had favorite saints. So you had these like friends, you know, you know, behind the curtain or behind the veil, and yeah, it was pretty cool. And my grandmother lived in Babylon, Long Island, and her um, house overlooked a cemetery. So there was a fence in her backyard. And then over this fence, you could see the headstones. And I remember from her bedroom, I used to love to go into her bedroom and just, I just, just get the best feeling. <laughs> this, is, this kid, this like six-year-old kid <laughs> looking out the window at the headstones. And as soon as I was old enough, as soon as I was old enough to, you know, walk around the neighborhood by myself, I used to visit the cemetery. And I had a friend who came up, you know, we grew up in Queens. So my friend went out with me, um, with my mother to visit my grandmother one Friday and our field trip was to the cemetery. She and I went to the cemetery together where my mother hung out with my grandmother. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> How am I, I saying? That's so funny. I could count the times I've been in the cemetery, but that's very cool. So and it appealed to you because that's where the angels were hanging out or? Oh, no, they're everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere. Oh, but it was just like, They're everywhere. But I just got a feeling of peace, you know, this feeling of repose, the feeling of all these people who've come before us and have left, or not really, you know, I, I just, I don't know, it's just a very good feeling. In fact, when we moved here to Connecticut, one of the things we really liked, <laughs> so you're coming, we hadn't even seen a house yet. We passed the reservoir, which we loved, you know, and there was a little sign that said duck crossing, which I just thought was so charming. So we, you know, we crossing along. And then when we got into the center of town, we saw the cemetery, you know, and it's a, it predates the revolution. So it's all those like really thin headstones. And we were just like, Oh, this is the place we're moving here. We <laughs> said, oh, okay. Now that really says something. You were so excited to live where you were living because you love that ancient cemetery. <laughs> yes. Wow, that, you know, don't go to Europe. You'll be lost in the cemetery there, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we've we've done that too. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's really cool. So I, I'm I know I'm diverging, but so has anything of interest that you'd be willing to share? Anything magical ever happened to you in a cemetery? Not in a cemetery, but I do have a very, very cool story to tell you. Oh, good. All right. All right. How much time do you have? I'm gonna, I'll, I'll make this fast. All right. So my gra I'll make it fast. My grandmother always talked about my grandfather. I never met my grandfather. He died in 1947. Okay. So that's um, that's quite a bit before I was born. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 15 years? Maybe 15, yeah, 15 years before I was born. Never met him, but I heard about him all the time. Heard about him all the time. And she told me the story about... Um, like during the depression, he was very interested. He's a big proponent of the new deal. And so was she, you know, FDR's new deal. So, um, and she talked about how important it was that, you know, we care for each other and the people have provided for it and the people aren't living in the streets. So, um, 
fast forward to around 2000, 2001, I started finding dimes in all these strange places. And immediately I just associated them with my grandfather because FDR is on, on the dime. And, and I would find them in the strangest places. They must, you know, going out to get a dress or shoes for a wedding with my mother. And I'd step out into the parking lot and there would be a dime right beneath my feet. And so I would just find these dimes everywhere. And I always connected them with my grandfather. Um, so then I went to Ireland in 2017 and I'd been to Ireland before, but it never occurred to me to go to the church where my grandfather had received his sacraments and where he'd grown up. So that was my mission for when I was in Dublin. And so we went to mass and it was really cool because they have this, um, they have this museum in the church, which is dedicated to like the architects of the Irish revolution. Well, that was cool. And of course it's a really old church and it's huge. And you could just imagine like these massive Irish families who are filling up the pews. And now of course it's like, there may be, I don't know, 50 people in there for mass, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The mass attendance has really fallen off. Um, so I had this idea of taking pictures before the mass. And then as it started, I said, wouldn't it be cool if I found a dime in Ireland? And then another voice said, you're not going to find a dime in Ireland. Just don't be ridiculous. Forget it. Forgot all about it. Okay. So two days later, we go to Mayo to visit the Mayo. Then we fly over to Edinburgh, have a great time in Edinburgh, go to a ton of cemeteries, having a great time. And then we had to fly back to Kilkenny in Ireland because I arranged to meet a friend there and we were staying with her. So she had taken a few days off to show us around. So in the morning, in the morning, we were going sightseeing and I went out the front door first. Pete went behind me. Pete's my husband. And she came out at third and I was just right near the car. So I'm a good distance off and I hear her voice and she says, did any of you, does this belong to any of you? And she's holding up a dime. And I'm like, I tell her the story, you know, I tell her the story and she's like, you know, wow. She was like, it's your dime then. So I said, I am going to get this dime framed as soon as I get home. And I did. Usually I don't follow up on stuff like that. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I went to the framer the day after we landed was there. So it's on my wall now. Um, so the other day I'm at the hairdresser and I haven't been to the hairdresser in over in almost a year because of the pandemic. And I tell her the story and she said, you know, people are, some people are really into that because, you know, I find pennies because her husband died recently. She's like, I find pennies whenever I have a question, you know, and I, I'll ask Gary and I'll find a penny. And she said, but um, she's looking for the diffuser. She couldn't find the diffuser to do, dry my hair. And she's looking around here around. She goes, you know, I'm going to go and get that bracelet. And it's this bracelet with a dime on it. And she gives it to me. She said, this is for you. Let me just get roll back a little bit because let me preface this. Before I told her the story, I said to her, I used to find dimes all the time because after I came back from Ireland, I didn't really find them anymore. After I framed that picture, that was it. And then Maggie, my oldest daughter, started to find them. But I didn't find them. And then I said that to her and she gives the, what? Like, what are the chances? I mean, I'm getting chills just telling you now. That is so amazing. I, you have yeah, that is a good story. That That is definitely a good story. So there you go. You got another time. And if you have time for another quick one yeah, with regard to, right, for Dublin, to Dublin, we were staying in Airbnb and it's in a little apartment. It's really neat. And I, we were going, um, I think that was the day we were going to the train station. We were going to Mayo and I was waiting for Pete to come out of the shower. And I'm just sitting there reading the paper. I don't know, whatever. I'm scrolling to my phone. And all of a sudden I had this eruption on the back of my left hand. It was like this er eruption. It was like a bite, but it was shiny and clear. And I'm like, what is that? And, you know, looking at, you know, looking around and then they started to appear and really, really itchy. I'm like, I'm like, do they have bed bugs in this place? So I start to freak. I start I'm examining the mattress. You know, I'm out with, you know, I am freaking out. And I told Pete and he's like, you know, maybe it's bed bugs. <laughs> and then he starts looking around and we cannot find evidence of anything. I'm looking through my clothes. I'm, it's bad. So then we're going to Pierce Station to get our train. And another one, I feel it. I feel the prick on the back of my hand, the stinging, and up comes another one. And I'm like, are there 
mis- bugs around. I mean, I didn't have, I never had a mosquito bite like this before. I've never seen anything like this before. And I'm like, what is going on? And so they started to erupt on the, my right side hand as well as we're going through Pierce Station. And I got on the train and I started to really worry. I was like, what is going on? Do I have a disease? Did I catch something? You know, I didn't know what was going on. Nothing had ever happened to me like this before in my life. So we got to Mayo and they didn't get worse, but they didn't really get better. They just, you know, kind of were chilling on my hands and um, that we went to Edinburgh and they just kind of stayed there. They didn't do anything more or less. And then we went to the Kenny, same thing. And I said to Helen, that was the first thing, the girl I was staying with, the friend I was staying with, I was like, you know, I've got these things on my hands. She said, the first thing out of her mouth was, maybe you caught bed bugs. <laughs> I said, Helen, I'm coming to your house with bed bugs, you know? I would never do that. Anyway, she was like so blase about it. But anyway, so we were looking for jewelry for Maggie and Charlotte, who are my daughters. Um, we wanted to get them Celtic crosses. So we went to a number of jewelers and I was wearing this Peridot ring on my right hand. And one of the jewelers said to me, oh, what a lovely ring. And I was so embarrassed because I just immediately covered my hands because they were covered with these welts. Anyway, they're not getting any worse, but they're not. Obviously, they're still, you can still see them. When it was time to go back to Dublin, Helen dropped us off at the bus stop. We took the bus into Dublin. And as we got into Dublin and I'm seated next to a woman, a stranger, because we, there weren't enough seats for people to sit together. They, as we're getting into Dublin, they start to, um, they start to erupt. There are more of them starting to erupt on my hands and my hands start to itch furiously. And I'm sitting next to this woman and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, much, what much must she be thinking? You know, I was so, um, I was so stressed. I was so I felt terrible and I'm hiding my hands. So I made a vow. I said, forget the frame. The first thing you need to do is make an appointment with a dermatologist. That's the first thing you do when you land. All right, get on the plane. And the plane takes off and we're lifting off. And I feel something in my hands. And I look at my hands and I said, am I going crazy? And I said, Pete, look at my hands. And the welts were disappearing right before our eyes. So what's that about? I have no idea. All I can think of is Dublin, like maybe some genetic memory or some ancestral memory, something about Dublin because they came, they erupted in Dublin. They kind of stayed. All right. There's just status quo wherever else I went. Then we got back to Dublin and they were back with a fury, you know, with a vengeance. And then I get up, we, we take off and we're like, we're literally, we're like, you know, we're on a slant, you know, we're on an angle angling up into the clouds and they disappear right before our uh, eyes, you know? So have you ever been back since then? That was 2017. No, I've not been back and I want to go back. Ah, well, I guess you'll have to let us know if you go to Dublin. (laughs) I will. That is so weird that you had these things and they kept erupting and they were itchy and then they were gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never came back. Maybe you're allergic to Ireland. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I hope not. <laughs> I yeah. really like Ireland. Honestly, that's ridiculous. I'm just kidding. All right. So, um, all right. So we diverged, but now let's get back to the EFT. So, what problem do you help solve? For clients? Well, it depends on the problem. I mean, people have come to me for food cravings. Um, they've come to me for help with athletic performance. Um, wow. Sometimes it's a belief, like I'm a nobody. I mean, that comes out and, you know, you'll have these really, really spectacularly capable and talented people who can't make it or for some reason have some sort of a barrier to getting where they want to go because they, and what comes out in the course of the work is a belief. You know, because a lot of the times, all the time, pretty much, I mean, our self-image is formed when we're so small and you have all those authority figures telling you things about you. And eventually those things, you know, if you have someone telling you from the time you can talk that you can do anything you set your mind to, or I believe in you, or, you know, you, you know, you're, you're a really capable person. If you get that positive reinforcement all the time, you're going to tend to live up to that. But most of us didn't get that. You get mixed messages. So you can do anything you set your mind to. And then 
in the next sentence, someone will say, well, you better be realistic. You need something to fall back on. You know, very few people make it in, you know, make it a singer. So, you know, you may have a nice voice, but so you're hearing all these mixed messages and they really do trip you up. So that's something we work on. You know, we can um, either um, completely eliminate that kind of a belief or just mitigate it to the point, you know, you know, over the course of the work, you can mitigate it, make lessen it, and it'll have less of an effect on you. But a lot of the times we'll just eliminate it altogether. And once you eliminate that from your um, belief system, you really can do anything. Wow. Yeah. That's, so you've really witnessed those kinds of transformations. Yes. And you know, what's really fun is to work with people who um, want to increase their income. So there have been people who come to me because they have some sort of a barrier, a big belief that people have when they're working with clients is that I should be doing this for free, or I shouldn't be like steer, spiritual people shouldn't be paid. That's yeah. a big thing. So, you know, that kind of a belief will definitely your effect, definitely affect your ability to produce a good income. Um, so we work on that kind of thing. That's always fun when you get, um, testimonials from people who say, oh yeah, I got, you know, we finished our session and you know, I got a new client. So oh, that that's kind of thing. Great. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about this, I was wondering if you could tell me about one or two clients that you helped that really like stuck with you. And like, it just, you know, went deep into your spirit about the transformation that they experienced. I think the most dramatic one, like a lot of the times when you have like these um, beliefs that are influencing everything, sometimes it takes a little while to get to the belief. So that won't necessarily be, give you a quick result, for example. So you'll be working on that for a while. Yeah. Although I, I like to work as, you know, um, I don't want to say quickly as possible, but I like to see a transformation. My intention is always to see the transformation from my client, right? Um not to have them hanging around longer than necessary, but sometimes it will take a little bit. But the most dramatic thing that I think I ever saw was this um, I a would-be triathlete came to me and she could run the 26 miles, the, the marathon portion of the triathlon with no problem. And she could do the bike portion. But when she got into water, when she got into water, she she couldn't do it. She, she panicked. Um, so we worked on that and... In one session, after one session, she was able to complete the triathlon. She eliminated her fear of water, being in deep water, and she was able to do it. So that was the most dramatic because that was quick. Yeah. That, I have, that was quick. That was one session. But that's, a, you know, that's not, um, I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, that happens every time because it doesn't, you know. Um, another cool thing was a woman who came to me with, you know, food cravings for a specific food. So we were able to eliminate that. And so, you know, that, that was very gratifying. Wow. That would, we'll have to talk later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, okay. So, um, so what happens like for you as a practitioner, when you like take the triathlete, for example, when you saw that transformation for her. What was that like for you? It was thrilling. It was absolutely thrilling because my intention is for the client to get a result, to get a transformation, for something to shift for them. So that was absolutely thrilling. Awesome. That's awesome. All right. And um, so let's take a step back for a minute and let's think about you. Now that you have, you've gone through your EFG training and you've done a lot, and you've had clients and you're, uh, you're at the third level now or you, are you? Um, yes, it's, I'm certified, but I have had the post, um, the post, the level three is post certification training. Okay, yeah. cool. So, you know, that's the pretty advanced level. So you've been through a lot yourself. I'm sure you've used the EFT. That's probably how you got started in the first place because you were using, am I making that up or? No. Um, okay. So that was kind of a synchronicity too. What happened there was, I think going back to what we were saying about how I was saying my spirit, spirituality informs everything. So um, when my mother was sick, I had developed a pattern of insomnia. So I was kind of having 
I wouldn't say kind of, I was having panic attacks. So I would go to sleep and fall asleep and then I'd wake up on the ceiling. And this was a pattern that established itself probably in July of 20, um, 2004 and persisted until September of 2006, at which point I thought I'd forgotten how to sleep. Oh. And my father and my sister said to me, you really, like I looked a hundred and they said, you really need a prescription. My sister Kathy in particular was saying, you need a prescription. And I did not want to do that. I don't know if the news had come out at that point about Carrie Kennedy driving and not knowing where she was with the, with a particular sleep aid, but I it had come out in the press that there were problems with these sleep aids. Like you, you would wake up in the middle of the night and you'd eat the contents of entire refrigerator and not yeah. remember them. Yeah. So I was like, I don't, what's that doing to your brain? So what it, I didn't want to go there. And, um, what I was doing at the time was I was, um, I would have a couple of, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd pop a couple of Guinnesses just to get my calm myself, you know, which is not really a sustainable, you know, way of life. So I said, there has to be a better way. And then, you know, somebody kind of, I met somebody in a networking meeting, Allison Held, and she was preparing for her certification. And I was going to Toastmasters at the time. I was learning to speak publicly and I had my first speech coming up and I was very nervous about it. And she said, you know what, can I work with you for your, you know, your speech? And I said, sure, absolutely. So we met at the Panera Bread on Bridgeport Avenue and you know, in the middle of the breakfast rush, like she has no qualms about this whatsoever, you know, tapping on her face, you know, in public, but I was kind of <laughs> like, oh, wow. Um, but, but she said to me, you know, how's it going this morning? And I said, oh, it's going well, but I didn't sleep very well last night. And she said, wait, tell me about that. So I told her and she said, well, forget the public speaking. So we worked on that for 45 minutes. And after which, like, it was funny because in the course of this, like, I went in there feeling pretty put together, but after I left, I remember my, the feeling of my sunscreen, because I wear sunscreen every day. I felt like you could feel my sunscreen, it like lifted off my face. <laughs> and I, I got into the car, I looked in the rear view and it was like, whoa, this big shiny mess. But anyway, that night I went to sleep and I slept through the night. Wow, that's transformation. I mean, it had been two years, right? It, yeah. It had been over two years at that point. And then that was that. And so I, you know, became really interested in tapping, tapping is specifically the whole self help thing, you know, because you can use it on yourself. And, um, I had great results, you know, on a, a trip that I took with my aunt, which, um, like a lot of things went awry and it was just tapping and praying. You know, people would say to me in the morning, well, the, what, one of the things that happened was that our, we showed up in Istanbul and our luggage had disappeared. So, you know, my aunt was, you know, she was elderly and, you know, I was kind of hoping that her clothes would show up. If anybody's clothes were to show up, let them be hers because it's hard to shop with somebody else and it's harder to shop with somebody else than it is for you. But I didn't have clothes for two weeks. So people were lending me clothes. Um, at some point in Santorini, we were able to get, you know, I was able to buy a couple of pieces, but um, the ship was really generous. They were doing my laundry for free. It was great. Um but that was just one of the things. And then my aunt stopped walking. She could no longer walk. She had like an arthritic episode. We didn't know what was happening, but she could no longer walk. So um, there was there were a lot of things going on with her having to ride in a wheelchair and me not having the physical strength to push her over cobblestones because a lot of, um, you know, Istanbul isn't set up the way, you know, a lot of American cities are set up a handicap. There are ramps everywhere. It's just not. It's an ancient city. It's a beautiful city. And so I'm trying to push her up these cobblestones. And finally, we were on a, on a trip with them. It was to the Holy Land with our parish. So that was the first stop in Istanbul. And ultimately, we ended up in Israel. But um, the priest who was with us offered to help push her around. And it was over 100 degrees. And I was behind him. And all I could see was like the perspiration, like pricking on the back of his polo shirt and just being absolutely mortified and thinking because people did start to, you know, a couple of people were like kind of like, who's slowing people down? So going back to the hotel with my aunt that night by letting them all go out and go to dinner and do whatever they needed to do. And just like, just like tapping and praying. And then somebody said to me, Terry, how are you getting through this? You know, because I did, I remember waking up, I had a really, really bad night in Istanbul. <laughs> My aunt was asleep in the bed next to me. And I'm like, we're, we're just beginning of a two week trip. 
we're just, this is just the beginning and everything's going wrong. And I'm like, how, how I really, I just was like going crackers in the hotel room and eating my room service sandwich while my aunt is slumbering. And, you know, I just started tapping and I started praying. And the next morning I woke up and it was like this curtain lifted where I felt I can take care of anything that comes my way. And, um, yeah. And wow. That's, yeah. that's a pretty powerful story. Well, people were saying to me, you know, they noticed, they were like, how are you doing this? And that's how I did it. Wow. Well, sounds like a good skill to have. Um, so what would you give, what advice would you give your younger self based on everything you know today from the magic and the unseen and the tapping and the, um, feel your feelings. That's, that's what comes to mind. What is mm-hmm. Feel your feelings, feel Feel your your feelings. Um, yes, because I grew up in a way like in in some ways, my mother was extremely, you know, she was in some ways she was extremely spiritual, but another way she, and she meant well, you know, she meant well, but she would say, don't feel that way, or you shouldn't feel that way, or, um, yeah, don't feel that way. And so what happened was I got to a point where I, when I was young, I'd question my feel like I didn't, first of all, I didn't acknowledge my feelings. Like I did have a feeling in my body. I wouldn't know what it was. And I overall wrote my own instincts in a lot of cases. And I didn't acknowledge my feelings. And it got to a point where I, I would have a feeling, but I couldn't identify it. So that's another thing tapping helped me with was bringing up feelings, acknowledging them, you know, identifying them and acknowledging them, which is very powerful. And then as you tap, you know, you can kind of move them through your system and have a different perception of things. But that was a really big thing. It was like, don't feel that way. And I remember somebody in seventh grade saying to me, I said something like, oh, I shouldn't feel that way. And she said to me, don't let anybody ever tell you how to feel. And that to me just sounded so revolutionary and just so um, maybe even a little indulgent because it was so foreign to me. And it took me many years, many years, because your feelings are signposts. That's your inner voice. You know, your feelings are important. And to override that, say, GPS is just is is, you know, you can get yourself into some bad situations. Wow, I can imagine what a big shift that would be if you were always told to not feel something, then you started to allow yourself to feel, then you probably really needed some tapping <laughs> when you started oh, to absolutely. experience all the feelings, because they can be overwhelming at times, though. But the tapping gives right. you a way to work through things. Well, Ronnie, what what happens when you're tapping is that you're really talking to your subconscious, you know? Yeah. And then your subconscious starts talking to you, you know, in the form of a memory or a feeling or something that you, oh, okay. Something out of left field. And, you know, you just keep tapping on it and you just follow that trail. And, you know, it's just remarkable. You know, you can start off in like a pretty agitated state or not even like, for example, not even know what you're feeling, which was the case for me a lot of the times. And then suddenly have that clarity. I think that's one of the greatest gifts of EFT is the clarity. Um, and then the second greatest thing about it is that you can do it on yourself. It's pretty easy to learn and it's very easy to learn. And um, yeah, it can change, change so much. That's great. What an important tool. And uh, I'm glad TV has turned that around and recognizes that now, right? Yeah. So, um, based on what you do and your kind of magic, what is the most important thing you would advise the listeners? I would advise, I'm sorry, I missed the last part. What is the most important thing you would advise the listeners to do? You know, what advice do you have for our listeners? I would advise them if they haven't looked into EFT to please do. Um, they can do that at my website or there are other fantastic no, organizations. Okay. It's terryhernan.com. So um, there is. Okay. So I'll put in the show notes, but T E R R Y 
H-E-R-N-O-N.com. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, so so let's just say it one more time so it sticks. So what is that important piece of advice? To learn to tap. And I shouldn't even tap. say learn because it's so easy. You know, it's very easy. You can pick it up right away. Oh, that is great. I know um, I've actually experienced tapping with you and I too found it very helpful. I don't remember what we were working on, but um, the first time I had an experience with tapping, I was at a big workshop, one of those big coaching workshops where you get a, you join a program and then you get a free ticket and another free ticket for your friends. So I had a woman who gave me her free ticket. So I went there and the first thing that happened, because we didn't go together and I didn't know her well, but when I found her in the crowd and there were, I don't know, definitely over a hundred people, maybe 200 people, it was big in some hotel in Florida. And so here I am thinking I'm going to hang around with this woman for the weekend <laughs> who I don't know that well. And then she says to me, oh, listen. Uh, I'm not going to hang around with you the whole time. You know, we, I mean, we can spend some time together, but, um, you know, I'm here to meet people. So I'm just letting you know, I probably won't eat meals with you or this or that. And I just went into this massive panic. <laughs> I can't. I don't blame I, you. I was, I was like, uh, first of all, I was so astonished that she would give me a ticket and invite me to go with her and then announce that she wasn't going to spend time with me. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I felt like I was just a, a float on the sea of people. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know the coach who was doing the program. And I was like, whoa. So they had um, already done a session with some tapping. because the co It was a coach who did a lot of tapping. It wasn't a tapping group, but she was tapping as her method to help people who would come up to the microphones and tell her their challenges and she would you know, tap them or whatever. So I had watched the process. That was my only exposure. <laughs> so I didn't even remember the points, but I ran, after I talked to this woman who had invited me, I ran into the ladies room and I, I locked myself in a stall and I just tried to do, follow the lines of thinking, you know, however it worked as best I could figure out from that one example I had seen to try to calm down because I was such a wreck. And um, I'm sure I missed a bunch of places and all kinds of stuff, but I did feel better. <laughs> and that was my first experience. So I came out of the bathroom after talking to myself and tapping in there and feeling crazy. And, um, and I was definitely calmer. I feel like I need to tap after hearing that story. <laughs> I cannot, I mean, I have tap, ladies room tapping is a big thing for me, but <laughs> I, I cannot, I'm, I, as an introvert, right? I am, if I were thrown into that situation, I was just getting like PTSD listening to that story. Like I cannot even imagine, I can't even imagine, you know, like being thrown into a pool like that of people I don't know. And oh, by the way, I'm not hanging out with you. Really? 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 I know that's exactly how I felt. And after a while, she did come over and have lunch with me one time or whatever. And she said, um, you know, I just didn't want you to cling to me. <laughs> I'm like, <gasps> okay, thanks. <laughs> anyway, these are the things we lived through. I got through it. You know, I learned some stuff at that. Uh, I met some people and, you know, whatever. And, and I went down there because it was near where my parents were living at the time. So um, I knew I was going to go see them after. But wow, that was quite an experience. And so that was my first exposure to tapping. So I can say... I know I did some work with you when, um, you know, working with a professional certainly is a lot more helpful <laughs> than what I was doing in the ladies room after she said that to me, but it definitely made an impression on me. I know it definitely helped and I know EFT can really matter, can really make a difference and can really create that transformation that you have mentioned. So, so thank you so much for sharing your kind of magic today and, sharing about EFT and how you work with clients. And don't forget, you can find Terry at terryhernan.com. And um, is there any last piece of advice you want to give or any last closing comments? Yeah, I do. Um, 
I was just thinking about it. You know, people will say, um, my feeling is just try it. Just try it. You know, before you take the ad, you know, people will say, um, nobody will ever ask you how an Advil works. Nobody asks that question. Nobody asks for proof that the Advil works. And when it comes to something like EFT, you've got all these skeptics and everything else. Don't be a skeptic. Just try it. See what happens. So what, what's the worst that could happen, right? Yeah, right. What's the worst that could happen is you spent 10 minutes doing something that didn't work. Well, the best that can happen is you can feel a heck of a lot better, and that is worth a shot. So great advice, Terry. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful, and um, that's the end of our session for today. And thanks again for sharing, and until next time, may you feel good fortune and blessings. Thank thanks you. Everyone. Thank you, Terry. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening today. Don't forget to like this episode if you enjoyed it, write a positive review if you feel inspired, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'll have more about love and magic next time. Until then, this is Oceana Fortuna reminding you to share your love and seek magic every day. Bye.